What is there to say about Psychonauts 2 that hasn't been said already? It's an unabashedly brilliant game, pioneered by a vision that's undoubtedly been refined and perfected over the course of the 16-year-long wait. The animation is sublime, the art style has been evolved to where it's even more beautifully grotesque than before, and the overarching plot is brilliant, taking the seeds from game one and putting them in a whole new light. And in turn, every level is brilliant. Each one takes the theming from their aesthetics and perfectly correlates them to the things that ail the corresponding character's mind. But, well, if you've read the title of the video, you know there's one mind in particular I want to delve into. If you didn't read the title and just stumbled in here, but spoilers, y'all, like, like, come on, I don't want to be the one guilty of ruining somebody's experience. <clears throat> but anyway, the mind I want to talk about today is the mind of Bob Zanotto, the uncle of the current grand head of the Psychonauts, and the great uncle of Raz's girlfriend, Lily. Now, among the many questions you may have, one of them is probably, why did I choose this brain to tackle? And, well, while I can't give a direct answer, I'll just say this. Bob Zanotto gives us a look into the mind of a broken man, one that, in an attempt to drown the sorrows of his life in greenhouse work and alcohol, has left naught but sorrow to live in his head. It's certainly a bleak sight to behold, but even before we go into the mind itself, there's a good bit to unpack here. Bob Zanotto was one of the original members of the Psychic Six, one of the original Psychonauts. But like the others in the group, he was separated from them and left fragmented after the battle with Maligula. At this point in the story, we don't know everything that's happened involving that, but judging how Helmet Fullbear, a character we came to know in a previous level was affected, and how Bob was his significant other, it isn't looking pretty, even before we come face to face with the man. When we do meet Bob, though, the pain he feels can be felt secondhand almost immediately through the mood, the tense atmosphere of this room. A tattered, busted greenhouse. And Bob himself, he's jaded, bitter, cynical. Especially when it comes to hearing about anything relating to the people he's lost, the people who are dead to him. Stop it! Right now! I don't want to hear any of those names ever again, you hear me? They're all... lost... dead. But... Bob... Especially that one! And yet, despite that, there's a feeling of remorse after he kicks Raz out of the greenhouse. Sure, he yelled at the kid, but maybe it was to keep him away for his own good. Or maybe he feels remorse because of a past event. This is further supported when Raz still persists, and the vine puts the door on Bob's head. He doesn't really retaliate. It's almost as if he's saying, Alright, you won. Whatever you do in there, I'm sure you can't make it any worse. As we enter the mind, we don't really see much, except for an island. There's some pots and a fire that seems to have gone out, but besides that, not much. Each of the pots has a sign, recognizing the three main points we'll touch upon later. Bob's mother Tia, the Psychonauts themselves, and Helmet. The conversation between Raz and Bob initiates, and here we start seeing some of the gardening metaphors come into play. There's a heavy aura of isolation surrounding the very mindscape of Bob. Huh. What did you plant here? Plant? What kind of seeds did you use? Oh, seeds. Yeah, that's right. No seeds. Lost them all. Where'd they go? Out there, I suppose. Can't really remember. He's lost all connections with the world. The seeds which would blossom into his relationships are no longer there. But why? How did he lose them? Who can say? It's been so long that even his memory escapes him. Furthermore, because it's been so long, even if he wanted to get out there again, he can't find a way off of the island. There's no way out on his own. I'm uh, not a good swimmer. Are you? No. Welcome to the island then, I guess. It's because there's no way to get off the island in Bob's mind that we end up using the door we came in with. 
This isn't like with Helmet, where we use his personified feelings and emotions to help awaken him. It isn't like with Compton, where we worked within the rules set by the voices in his head that demanded his very best efforts. This time, we have to use our own resources to fix what's wrong with this man, because he can't do it alone. Wait! Don't go. Come with me! Despite how hesitant to be personal Bob is, though, ironically this is still maybe one of Psychonauts 2's most personal levels. That much becomes apparent as we begin to sail around. There's flowers blooming in certain pathways above the ocean, trails of forgotten hopes and aspirations. On various islands, there's memories in forgotten corners, and larger traumas residing within the bottles. The memories outside of the bottles are some of the people in Bob's life. Hey, Otto. Glad Bob still keeps some friends around. Friends? Please. Or, well, the impressions he was left with before his isolation. But of course, the largest source of goings-on in Bob's brain is what he's buried beneath the surface. It's time to uncork the bottles, and what better place to start than the history with his mother. As we pop open each bottle, we're presented with a glimpse into Bob's life in various eras. Usually these levels have some sort of clever metaphor to circumvent telling the story completely straight. And while yes, Bob's level still has a lot of clever metaphors at work, I mean the memories are literally bottled up, this mind still feels the most real. Almost as if, through all the drinks and sad feelings, he hasn't really bothered to cover or decorate said memories like the others. You almost forget you're in the bottles after a while. But back to the memories of Tia. Out of the three bottles, I feel like I might have the most to say here, which seems ironic because this is the one that Bob was trying to drown out of his mind the most. There's glimpses in the beginning of a past life with his mom, where Bob would attend a music recital as a young boy. Some details show how Bob had to take over a lot of responsibilities in the house, with it just being him and his mother there. But as we see more, his vision of this old home begins twisting and warping due to his forgetfulness. Shortly after that, we take a moment outside the house. And this section is where one of the main obstacles of the level kicks in. The Moth. While not necessarily an enemy you fight directly, the Moth will obstruct your goal stealing the bright seeds you plan to bring back to help rejuvenate Bob's mental blossoms, placing them in really far-off locations. The moth seems to want nothing to do with rejuvenating these memories, and just wants to protect others from getting involved. I wouldn't want you to get hurt. Here, let me just take this somewhere safe. Wait, no, I want that. No, you don't. But what's the deal? Why is this moth so protective of the seeds? Aren't they Bob's chances to start again? Well, it'll become clear in due time. Going back to Bob's mind though, we soon see the bulb bobs in this bottle, right after the little moth thing. Considering the greenery in these memories, I could see this being a metaphor with Bob also taking a plant-like form. Will I elaborate? Heh, <laughs> no. Okay, yes I will, but later. Hang on! I'll break that final vine. No, 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 just leave it. I, I think this is all the freedom I can handle right now. We alternate between the water and the house interiors, where we learn more about the past that Bob's repressed. This level introducing the tougher variant of the regret enemy is a really inspired theming choice. Bob may say they're somebody else's, but we know how much his past weighs him down. However, it's not completely obvious what's happened to Tia until a bit later in the section. The statues in the garden show a young Bob, unable to get through to his mother. He's insecure, and his mother keeps spending longer and longer in the greenhouse. Until, well, ultimately. What are you doing out in the greenhouse for so long? At some point after her husband's implied death, Tia's greenhouse became an excuse for her alcoholism. She would just go there for extended periods of time to drown her sorrows. And in turn, she may have ended up dying from alcohol poisoning. Young Bob must have blamed himself for being unable to stop her at this point. But there are some minds that can be too late to change. 
The way the vines hold the bottles, it can also be inferred that after a certain time, they weren't exactly helping with those problems either. It's also implied that Bob almost forgot this inciting memory, considering how deep in the bottle it is. And well, since Bob was almost the same as Tia when we first encountered him, isolated in a greenhouse, drowning memories like this one in alcohol, the implications are pretty harrowing. Those who forget the past may be doomed to repeat it. Next up are Bob's memories of the Psychonauts, memories he seems to remember a bit more vividly. We find another bulb Bob, in a section where we use his water parting ability a bit more creatively. It's really interesting to me, the different facets of Bob and how they contrast each other, yet work so well in showing how he perceives himself. The bulbs repulse those around them, similarly to how Bob may feel he does when he is inebriated. This would explain the bulb form, too. He's not quite fully bloomed or grown like this, still merely a tuber without his roots entirely settled. The moth- oh heck, the moth's here again! You're welcome! What? For saving you from that time bomb! It's just a seed! Ah, but isn't a seed just a bomb in slow motion? No, 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 wait, no, that's, that's, that, I, I see where you're coming from, but, but you're wrong. As we enter the still-developing mother lobe, the Psychonauts HQ before it truly blossomed, all the negative aspects of Bob's personality culminate around the entrance, and as we head inside, the mother lobe begins deteriorating. Everything starts to crumble and fall apart as we carry the bulb inside. The reason? We learn that Bob was fired from the Psychonauts by his own nephew, Truman. After the battle waged against Maligula, which caused Bob's love, Helmet, to be lost to the sea, Bob found himself in a deep, self-loathing, alcoholic spiral, the likes of which he was unable to cope or heal from. For the interest of what was left of the Psychonauts at that point, Bob had to be let go, despite his protests. But the question still remains, just how close were Bob and Helmet before this happened, hmm? Well, I mean, Helmet's level does a good job answering that, but for the sake of this video, the question still remains. As we approach the third bottle, there's a sort of fondness to this one that the other two didn't quite have attached to them. I mean, before you even land, Raz finds himself sliding down the tube, and various figments of Helmet and Bob's relationship are scattered about the slide. It's clear this bottle houses some of the best years of their young lives. And while still submerged by alcohol in some respects, compared to the other two bottles, this last one is in much less ruin at first glance. We go through some trippy cake set pieces, and after that, we find ourselves at a recreation of Bob and Helmut's wedding. It's clear that Bob still blames himself for what happened to his beloved. That much is symbolized when Bull Bob cracks the Helmut statue atop the cake, and there's a skull in there. But the fondness of this memory far outshines these details. As we enter the wedding hall and hear the happy couple's vows, their love beyond anything else was pure and true. It was one of the few good memories Bob remembers among his troubled past. I, Robert Zanaro, take this man, Helmut Fulbear, the happiest day of my life. I used to think I loved plants more than people, until I met this man. When these feelings appeared in my heart, I thought they were weeds, and I tried to pull them out. But this mighty oak has given me shade, shelter, and something to lean on when I needed it. Just when I thought I was turning to seed, you made me bloom again. I do. I... I'm not crying. You're crying! After we retrieve the third and final seed, things should be wrapped up, right? All said and done, yeah? Well, yeah, but something isn't quite right. I'm just... I'm starting to remember why I got rid of those seeds. 
All brought together, the seeds start to take shape, growing and spiraling out of control into these hostile forms that start to tear up this world, slinging hurtful thoughts at Bob about how he couldn't keep his relationships together, how he left the important people in his life behind, or worse, to die. The thoughts that filled his mind with doubt, despite the fact that he largely isn't at fault, they resurface. All the while, the moth recaptures Bob, encasing him in a cocoon to protect him. Things continue to twist and distort throughout the battle, the rapids raging and the plants pouncing. It's a dire situation, one that makes it feel as if Bob's mental state may be too far gone to help. But the one thing that saves him, the one thing that brings him to his senses, is his faith in his most positive memory. How can you do this to Bob? You love him! Love? <laughs> I don't really love him. If I did, how could I have left him all alone? Helmet? Helmet would never say that! Bob then starts to retaliate against his inner turmoil. All the while, the moth tries to drag him away from the whirlwinds of worry. But the fact that Bob is getting somewhere, anywhere, shows that there's still hope. A spark, no matter how small, is still a spark. And as we defeat this greenhouse guilt trip, that spark helps Bob's branches enter a proper full bloom. The entire time, the moth was a mask. It symbolized the want of isolation, to keep oneself to the alcohol, and to generally avoid conflict. All the times the moth tried to hide the seeds, that was Bob, trying to make sure nobody else was affected by the mistakes he believed he made. To make sure nobody else would see how he messed things up. This was foreshadowed by the fact that the moth itself shares Bob's face on its wings. But as we defeat Bob's inner demons, he no longer has a need for this mask. He's not completely ready to go back and face what he's lost head on, but he's healing. As Bob accepts himself, willing to take his first steps forward in a long time, other seeds begin to surface from the water. There's so many buds Bob can reunite with now that he realizes he can. And well... I'll just take them one at a time. What a phenomenal level. Bob's Bottles shows the bleak view of someone burdened by the many traumas of their life. Bob was pushed towards the edge and only teetered there for so long because he was afraid of confronting those people again. He was overwhelmed, but he wasn't sure if people would forgive him for the things he's done, for what he left behind. But regardless of if they will or not, nothing good comes from hiding behind a mask from ignoring those you kept in touch with for so long. By nurturing those relationships, there's still a chance. A chance for even the most disheveled, broken person to learn to love life again. If there's one thing to take away from this, it's that if you have unresolved seeds, ones that you've neglected, do your best to care for them. Don't leave them waiting. Resolve them right away. Resolve them when you can. Stay in touch with people, instead of hiding away in guilt over things you couldn't control. Thank you for coming. Thank you for staying. Thank you for watching the show. And take care, everyone.